Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you. So today's session is going to be by Lauren Enders Gonzalez. Uh, she is, um, many may not need an introduction to many of us who have been seeing her for the fifth time. So Lauren, a big, big thank you for joining us today and for giving us your time. Sure. So to give her background, she is an SLP uh, and an augment, uh, AAC and AT consultant working for Bex, uh, Bucks County, sorry, Pennsylvania in the U.S. She has more than 25 years of experience and is extremely passionate about providing access to communication to and empowering parents and caregivers. She presents at several leading conferences around the world, and uh, she is known for her regular sharing of AT and AAC resources uh, on social media accounts. She has published many blogs on the practical AAC, and she has more than 12,000 followers on Facebook, 34,000 followers on Pinterest, and more than 1,000 followers on Instagram, and all of them growing all the time. So a very warm welcome to you, uh, Lauren, and we are all looking forward to your presentation on literacy. This is the first time we are actually going to have some something on literacy uh, with our viewers. So we are looking forward to it. And a lot of professionals are also looking forward to this. So great. Over to you. Okay. Well, I am happy to be here, even though it is quite early here in the US and on the East Coast, I'm outside of Philadelphia. Um, in Pennsylvania. So um, I'm excited to hear that that I'm kind of the first one to uh, start talking about AAC and literacy in um, in these videos in the series. Um, the, this is very close and dear to my heart. I believe with with all my heart and soul that AAC and literacy do actually go hand in hand. But I know that for many, um, it's very hard to imagine how you might work on literacy with um, some individuals who have complex needs and maybe need AAC, uh, maybe have behaviors. There's all kinds of things that that we can think will prevent somebody from being able to access literacy. But I've seen literacy work in just about every situation. So let's get into it. All right, so this is just to review some of the things that you as viewers were hoping that I will touch on. Now, we only have an hour, and I will surely not be able to hit everything, but I was excited to see this pretty extensive list. On the list was a lot of things about, you know, how do I enhance skills? I need ideas. Um, how do I begin there's a, there were several about kids that have ASD or kids with autism. Um, they were there was a lot of similar ones, and I what I tried to do was work into my presentation uh, things targeting each of these areas. Uh, it's only an hour, so we'll see. But um, let's go. So in the beginning, we're going to just do an introduction of what I'm actually talking about uh, with literacy. Um, I'll talk about a couple important literacy facts, um, but nothing nothing too specific because what I really wanna get to is reading in connection, what we should be considering a book and the fact that everyone can be an author. So I only have one learning objective for all of you today. Uh, usually I've got three and I'm all formal. And the only objective is to start thinking about literacy today. That's it. So I think each and every one of you can absolutely meet this objective, meet this goal. Um, and you can get a lot of other things as you do kind of delve into the world of literacy. Um, there'll be a lot of other perks, a lot of other positive things that you will see come out of, of that venture. So what I really want to do is just kind of give you an introduction to why are we even talking about AAC and literacy going hand in hand? Um, and there are a lot of reasons. 
So when we think about why for us, why for us as families or caregivers or really any stakeholder who supports someone learning to communicate with AAC, there are a lot of whys. There's reasons and they are. So learning to read and write is especially important for AAC learners because literacy supports communication. So literacy can help an AAC user um, extend their communication abilities beyond what's programmed into their device. It gives AAC users power to share ideas and information in more ways. So one of the things I'd like you to consider is if you think about um, the, the system that your AAC user is learning or working with, um, maybe it's Avaz and maybe it's something else, doesn't really matter, but none of those systems, no matter how much time you spend, can ever represent all of the language that is in an AAC user's head. There will always be a gap because we are not able to read minds and we also have limited time. So what we can do is we can use tools that are very robust, which will prevent some of the challenges, but there is no app, there is no tool, there is no device that will meet every single vocabulary need that somebody is going to have. We just, it's just not possible. I think it's important to think about when we think about how we speak versus write, it's really important to consider that the part of the brain we use to write is the part of the brain that we use for AAC. So it's actually a different part of the brain than we are using when we are speaking. So it's even a little bit more complex than we think because it includes all of the aspects of writing as well as generating language. So let's take a look at the next one. So it's especially important to AAC learners because literacy expands knowledge and understanding. It exposes, well, I, it says AAC users, but literacy does this for everyone. It exposes AAC users to new vocabulary, new concepts, new perspectives, and it helps build background knowledge and promotes comprehension when communicating. So it's not just about the being able to read, being able to decode a word, being able to figure out the answer to a comprehension question. I think it's really, really important to mention that individuals with disabilities have a far more limited access to background knowledge and experiences. If we can replace some of that with the information in books, well, then I say I'm all for it. So learning to read and write is also especially important for AAC learners because it empowers self-expression. And if you think of people that you know who need AAC, um, self-expression can be a big challenge. Uh, and that can lead to a lot of other issues that are challenging for us to, to try to manage or try to support them. Um, people need to be able to express themselves. So using AAC, which is really a type of writing, even though you may be using it on a high-tech device and just pushing a button, it's still that part of the brain that writes is a way to give AAC users an outlet for their thoughts and their feelings and something we don't really think about, their creativity. Everybody is creative. Everybody has creativity. But I think sometimes it's a little challenging for us to think of ways 
to encourage and pull out the creativity in someone that interacts a little different than we do. So it's also important for AAC learners to become literate, to develop literacy skills, because it helps the person who's learning literacy to become more self-confident. With literacy skills, you feel more confident and independent in school, in social situations, and just in general in life. And I think an important thing to mention also is that people's expectations of individuals with disabilities are often not super accurate. And when we see that someone has even some literacy skills, there is often kind of a raising of the bar in our in our heads. We think, oh, okay, this person can do this. This person can do this. There's almost an immediate thought that the person who is using AAC, if there's some literacy skills, well, they must really be in there. Uh, and I think a lot of times that is something that is not assumed and the expectations are too low. And when expectations are too low, we, we don't provide instruction and teaching and support to the levels that we really should. So yes, it builds self-confidence, but it it also is just so important because the people around that AAC learner need to have a higher expectation so that, you know, they expect more and teach more and all that good stuff. So literacy is also important for AAC learners because it expands their opportunities. So AC users with strong literacy skills have more educational and employment opportunities, and they're better self-advocates. Now, I do wonder if you've all noticed that all of the things that I'm saying so far are really the benefits of literacy for everyone. But what I'm trying to do is make sure that everybody leaves this session with the understanding that literacy is for everyone. Everyone. So learning to read and write is especially important for AAC learners because literacy also supports connection to culture. I don't think that many of us really give a ton of thought about how important our culture and our traditions and our connection with the people in our community really are to us. Um, and I'm currently teaching an AAC course to graduate students, and we did an activity where I had each of them remember some kind of tradition that they did in their family growing up um, and what it meant to them. And it was a favorite activity out of all the activities we did this year. It was one of the favorites. People loved talking about their unique family or um, cultural traditions. It was, it was particularly motivating for pretty much everybody. And what I noticed was I gave a minimum, I think I said that they had to do a paragraph, almost everybody gave me a lot more than that. So when we feel excited about something because we've experienced it, we are much more likely to want to talk about it, to want to express things. Uh, so connection to culture, I think, is more important than we even might imagine. So the other piece is that we share information as humans through literacy. So if we can develop literacy skills in an AAC user, it automatically is kind of bringing them more of a connection. To, to their culture and their society. So what I've kind of just led up to is that literacy learning is really critical for AAC users. 
it helps them ma maximize their communication potential and it helps them to be able to participate more fully in every part of life. So that's school or work or family life or social interactions, everything. Um, it, I don't think that we can um, overemphasize the importance of moving towards literacy. I do want to stop and say that I am not suggesting that every person will become someone that's going to read at a, let's say, you know, high school level or even even first grade level. There are different levels that we can reach, but all of us can begin the process and start working on emergent literacy. So what is emergent literacy? Well, this is something we often miss. We don't think about, um, but boy, does it come early. Emergent literacy skills are those early skills, the early knowledge and the early attitudes about print and books that help set the foundation for later literacy development. So I would imagine that many of you out there watching um, have had an experience where you have interacted with a very, very young child and a book, perhaps a board book. And that child who may not even be in some cases, you know, six months old is already getting the concept that pages turn. They're reaching out, they're trying to turn because exposing them to literacy and all of the things that go along with reading and interacting with a book, um, they all help set the foundation and boy, do they come in way earlier than we really think about. So emergent literacy, it helps us develop print awareness by allowing us to look at books, to listen to stories, to learning how print works. So you think about those really early experiences. You might just be sitting with a book, you're turning the pages, you're telling stories. And one of the biggest pieces here is that it's not just print awareness, it's connection. You are developing a relationship. And that's one of the biggest, most important aspects of, you know, reading with someone, regardless of who they are or how they communicate. That when you sit and you share some type of, you know, reading material with another person, you are building a connection. And those connections are incredibly powerful in terms of supporting that person's motivation to communicate, to learn more, to interact, pretty much to do everything. Emergent literacy also helps build somebody's expressive language by expanding their vocabulary. If I have one individual who uses AAC that I never sit and read to, and I have another that every day we read one book, think about how many more words that second individual will see and hear and, and get to experience just because they have been introduced within literacy. It helps build expressive language because when you are talking about a book or about some kind of print, generally we end up introducing new concepts. It's also very helpful in supporting understanding, comprehension, and just using language through AAC. Because if you are talking about a book, I think that many of you have probably seen me um, kind of harp, I should say, I don't know, or talk before about the importance of modeling. So 
for somebody to want to learn to communicate with AAC, they have to understand that it's a it's a valid means of communication and they have to see what that looks like. And they do that when you talk to them with AAC. And I'm sure that there's there's lots of uh, <laughs> there's lots of resources in the Avaz blog. There's lots of resources in um, on all over social media about you know how to really begin modeling. But that is that is key, and we are modeling even when we are reading a book. Emergent literacy also helps us to develop phonological awareness skills. So those those abilities to notice and manipulate the sounds in spoken language, even if that individual is not producing natural speech. So they're not using mouth words, so to speak. It also helps us expand our vocabulary. Pretty obvious, you know, that if you're seeing more words and hearing more words, you're going to eventually use more words. Well, we can also work on um, emergent language with with AAC learners, but with we can experiment with marks on paper, so early writing, using symbols, pictures, and letters with purpose. One of the things that I always loved, there was a um, there was a video from We Speak Pod, um, the the late um, Karen Owens and her daughter Angela, and it was an activity where she had Angela writing, and it was she was using partner assisted scanning. She was there was no pencil involved. She was using her communication system to provide the responses for the written work. And then uh, Karen, or mom, was scribing that. But what she did that was so, um, so important and uh, something that I think we should all emulate is she gave a reason for Angela to do the writing. So rather than just saying, okay, I want you to write your name. You need to write your name. You need to learn to write your name. What she did was she said, oh, look at this baby doll. This is a new baby doll. We're adopting her. We need to have a birth certificate for her. So from, from the get-go, from the beginning, she was setting the stage for her daughter to understand that there was purpose and meaning behind that work that she was doing. Because literacy is hard work for everybody. And then you think about somebody who is an AAC user, um, maybe with a complex body, uh, and it, it's, it's even harder. So, so, so important that when we provide opportunities for somebody to work on literacy, that we be a little creative and that we come up with a reason why we're doing it rather than just, you need to write your name because that's what we do in school and let's do it. So rather than just that, you know, you have to, because if there's an understanding of why we need to write our names on our papers because Oh no, after you all leave, if your name's not on your paper, I won't know who said what. So always, always provide that reason why you are reading or writing. So this is a big question and this is one of the easiest that I can address today. So when should I introduce literacy to my AAC learner or um, to the, the person that I am supporting? Because I, you know, I imagine that we have professionals and parents and caregivers and maybe siblings and all kinds of AAC stakeholders. So people that have some kind of connection to a need to teach AAC. Well, when should I introduce it? It's so easy. 
Now, introduce it now. Think back to the what I was saying a little bit earlier that it's amazing when we sit with a very, very, very young child, a baby, and they are starting to understand concepts of print. They are starting to understand that she's going to turn the page. She's going to say something out loud. Maybe even if I make a noise, she's going to look at me and she's going to say something else. There's all of those experiences. So what that suggests is we need to start now. So that's an easy one. This is a question that that um, many people have. Um, I'm sure many of you may be using uh, electronic or um, you know high tech systems. Some may be using low tech or paper based systems. Regardless of what kind of AAC you're using, often the question comes in: Where do I put the words that are in the books? So let's say that we have a book about construction machines. Well, where do I put excavator or bulldozer or steamroller or whatever other kind of that? That's not my strong suit. So I don't know how many of those I can come up with. But where do we put those words? And I just want to share that in many cases, we get a little bit thrown off here. So I'm going to show you a vase, if I can get this to link in. Let's see. I'm going to use a vase as an example. Thank you, technology. Okay, so what a lot of people kind of make the assumption that they should do is they should make it easier for somebody by putting all the words in one's expected spot. So for example, if we were doing a book, we might go into topics and we might create, I think a lot of times what people think is that they want to create a, a, a folder or a button that is for a specific book. So, you know, let's say it was the cat in the hat. Now this applies, I'm showing you an Avaz, but this applies to absolutely every kind of system there is, paper-based, electronic, you name it. It's about organizing vocabulary. So if I made a folder for cat in the hat, And let's see, uh, check that out. <laughs> that looks better. And then I connected that folder to a new page. Many people would think that all of the words that the student needs for that story should be in that folder. And it seems like it would be an awesome idea. But what ends up happening is imagine if you were reading The Cat in the Hat with somebody um, and you had you wanted to talk about stripes because the cat in the hat, his hat has stripes on it. Well, what if you were having a discussion about stripes? Would it make sense to have to navigate to your topics, to this particular book, to perhaps another folder within the book folder to find the word stripes. What ends up happening is it makes it so inefficient. And it's really important to know that AAC use is hard and it is slow. So the deeper that we bury things in a system, the less likely somebody is to be willing to put out the energy that you know, there's a lot of energy that's needed to um, to communicate when we're using AAC. Um, I do encourage anyone who is an AAC stakeholder, so somebody who supports, works with, 
has, you know, has an interaction with somebody who uses AAC to spend some time attempting to communicate only with some form of AAC. And I think this, the challenging aspect, how much energy it takes will become a little clearer. So while we could create a cat in the hat button and then go in and then have um, all the words that we, maybe all the verbs that we're used to seeing in cat in the hat and all of the different scenes and maybe things like stripes or maybe even a word like rhyme. It sounds like a great idea, but what if we want to talk about rhyme and we're not talking about the cat in the hat? For us to have to navigate through all of those folders to get to a very specific book when we're really talking about a broader concept um, is not a good use of any of our time. So I am going to delete that specific folder and instead, so cat in the hat, if I wanted something about stripes, maybe I would go to the describing page um, and maybe, maybe there's a bunch of different patterns that I want to make sure people can, that are using AAC can talk about. So maybe I might even put a little folder in here that says patterns. And then when you open up patterns, it says stripes, paisley, polka dots, um, whatever else, you know, I'm just not thinking about all of them, but just to give an example, but then it's in a place you use those words to describe. So it's in a more expected location and maybe easier to get back to. So that is my quick thought on where to put vocabulary. We need to be very thoughtful. And I do encourage you to really work with your speech language pathologist or with the teacher or wh whoever you are working with to be very thoughtful about what's gonna be the most efficient way for your AAC learner to find the vocabulary they need over and over and over. All right. Uh, just pausing a bit for uh, a question, yeah. Lauren. Okay. Uh, Rajan yep. says, what AAC do you use and how far and how far someone who is very literary but has lost speech? Example, Parkinson's. Ah, um, well, somebody with somebody with an acquired communication disorder where they have lost speech, but they are already literate. Um, they typically require some of the most robust, I mean, everybody should have a robust system, but if you think about it, they already typically have literacy skills. They have this vast fund of knowledge. So you want to use something that is going to be able to meet all of their needs. In some cases, um, actually in many cases, Text-based, so literacy-based solutions are used with people with acquired injuries. Once you have already become literate, you know, that literacy meets all the needs because while you might be able to go in and find the picture that you need, if you can't find it, you can always spell it. So a lot of adult users who are literate use text-based systems or a mix where maybe they have buttons for very frequently used categories. So they may have an emergencies folder with phrases like, um, you know, I need help right now or, you know, whatever they might need, but they also need the ability to construct new thoughts and language. So in many cases, um, acquired communication in, um, injuries or um, disabilities in adulthood, in many cases, we see um, either text-based or a mix of text and um, symbol-based. All right, so we already did our little talk. 
Okay. So here I'm going to show you, I realized when I was working with this magnificent young lady um, who has absolutely exploded in language in the last two years. So she did not have AAC at 19 years old, none. She's maybe 20 words uh, with her natural speech. They're not all 100% intelligible, um, although some some are pretty clear. Um, she is engaging, she is funny, uh, but she had no way to express any of that. And what I've realized in working with her is that when we sit down with a book, what I'm doing with that book is quite different than probably most of you out there are thinking of what should be happening with a book. When most of us sit down with a book and a child or a book and an adult, we think about the standard conventions. Okay, I got I to gotta read the title. We got to turn the page. We have to go in order. Um, but if you impose all of those rules, we kind of lose that part about building a relationship and connection. So I would love for you to think about that with an emergent literacy learner, with a, a child or with somebody, could be an adult who is beginning their literacy journey, because that's a thing too. There's, It's never too late. But it's super important to kind of get a sense of what that might look like if we're not demanding perfection in the way something is read. Should we read your book? Yeah, oh, no, we can. Oh. You know what? First thing we have to do, Morgan, look at this. It's upside down. We need to turn the book around. Ready? Turn. Whoa! There we go. I turned it. Now I can see. Here, I'm going to turn the page. Let's go back to the beginning. Oh, five black cats on a dark, misty night. Oh, I see one. Wow. Seventeen. Five. Seventeen cats? Meow. 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 That is a lot of cats, Morgan. And a mo one moon. One. Yep, I see the moon. One moon. One. Fourteen. Fourteen what? Are there 14 houses? Do you think we should have 14 bears? 14. Oh, 14 bears would be fun. What do you see? Oh, 14. Do you think there are 14, 14. stars? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Oh my goodness. 26, 17. Wait a minute, wait a minute. There's 26 stars? Oh, one, one two, two, three, three four, 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 five, five six, six, seven. I'm seven. getting tired. Is he stuck? Let's go back. Are they playing in there? Play. Oh no, she's got to drink them again. I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. Can I have some? Can I have some? Whoops. Dessert. Do a better job with this. Goldfish scrambled eggs. Wait, for dessert, you're having goldfish, goldfish. and scrambled Gosh. eggs? Okay, let's go back to our slides. Okay, so I'd love for you to think about what you saw. Um, it's probably very different than what you think you have to do when you sit down with a book and a communicator. Um, you know, we think, well, we have to we have to read the title and then we have to turn the page and then you know they have to pay attention while I'm when I'm doing the page. Um, what I was focused on was connecting with Morgan, and if you if you really watched her. In between each exchange, 
she looks up at me and stares and is so intent on waiting for my reaction because she knows that I respond to everything that she says. Whether she points, whether she uses her voice, whether she uses the device, no matter what, if she points to something, then I was, oh, moon, then I talked about it. If she um, if she said something, then I'll say something about it. Um, but what I didn't do was get stuck in, no, 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 we have to turn the page. No, nope, let's read the next page. We're not talking about bears. Because when we make reading a task with specific demands, we lose the joy. The joy is what brings us connection. And the connection is what brings motivation to communicate more. So I thought that that was a really important thing for us to kind of briefly go through. So literacy is for all children, really, and all adults. So really, I should have just said literacy is for everyone. about, you know, well, I can't find books that are appropriate or that are interesting for the, the learner that I'm working with. You know, my child, like, there is not one book that he doesn't rip to shreds, or there is not one book that she doesn't throw across the room, or there is not one book that she will even gaze at for a second. Well, I think that we need to think about what we consider, oops, I went a little too far, what we consider a book. So of course, books are books. You know, I don't know if I have any books over here. Probably not, because I'm not that prepared. But, you know, we all know what a book looks like. It's got a title page, and it's got all the other pages in the middle, and it's got a back cover. Um it's got a spine usually. It might have a different kind of spine. So it may be spiral bound or it may be um, maybe bound like from a publisher. But that's what we think of when we think of books. But I think it's really important to broaden your perspective and think anything that has information and text that has the ability to have pages turned is a book. So when I went looking, I found some interesting relics, some interesting, uh, very old things. So this, let me see if I can get my gallery so I can make sure that I am showing you in the right spot. Hold on. Okay. This is a book. So you can see that this was half pieces of paper that were folded and stapled. I wrote this book. So we got Lauren Schwartz, that's my maiden name. I wrote this book in first grade. This is a book. I even put a table of contents in there. But all I have on each page is an image and a word. That's all we need. <laughs> my spiders were not so great. Ghost. This is a book. So I think that we also need to really broaden our perspective, like I said, um, about what's a book and what's something we can read together. This is something that I did in a classroom in the early 2000s. And we created a story. And we actually focused on some core words, but the students got to fill in. So, oh, scary monster, said Randy. And she went to grandmom's house. These students were using their communication devices. So when they said she went to, then we could encourage, oh, that's a place. And then no matter what she, what she chose, okay. So she said grandma's house, but it could be we went to the garbage dump or we went to, I don't know, the bathroom. 
whatever they say with their communication device, we can support. So you can, you know, make spiral bound, you can um, take paper and just fold it. There's also, think about um, many of our friends who are autistic may have particular interest in things that are digital. So iPads, computers, things like that. There are some incredible tools that make you very, very um, quickly and easily be able to create custom content with them on screen. So there's things like Book Creator, which you can do 40 books for free, bookcreator.com. There's things like Canva. There's things like Google Slides. You could easily make a book in Google Slides. You could have each slide be a page. Um, so I just, I really want you to leave broadening your thought. Let's say you have somebody who rips everything. Well, why not have a couple laminated pages and then attach them all together with packing tape? Because then it's much harder to rip. The laminate doesn't rip and the packing tape is not as likely to rip. So, you know, think outside the box, think more broadly. Piece is that there is a sense of, uh, we already talked about the fact that literacy can help support self-confidence building, help support connection, help support all of these things. I think it's important to, from the outset, realize that everyone is an author. Everyone has ideas that they can creatively share. Maybe they are more limited. Maybe it's just, you know, one word on each page. And maybe the word is not what you typically would think of. So maybe you have shown somebody a picture of the sky, but then the word they give you is avocado. But instead of saying avocado, no, we're looking at the sky. This is a blue sky. Tell me blue. What that does is it kind of deflates the per person. Why do they want to communicate if you're correcting them? And we have such good intentions when we do that correcting. But it's um, it doesn't work. It actually goes the wrong way. So if we think about everybody as an author and everybody being able to contribute to their own stories, imagine the places that we can take to our individuals, our, our AAC learners, and really every learner. <laughs> this, this presentation could be given to any group. It doesn't have to be for AAC learners. All these, the literacy does all these things for everyone. So um, it's, there's just so much power, but, but um, before I sign off for, for the uh, question section, I just wanna share that when, when we have individuals who have limited experience, many times we have a lot of confusion about what might be an interest and what, what might hold their interest. Remember that anything can be a book. So if somebody, perhaps they're really, really intent on watching YouTube a lot of the day, but you have a list of the things that they tend to go back to. What if you made a book out of images from that YouTube video? And then you had them write something about each page. So if it's an image from the YouTube video, and they go to their communication system and they say, silly, then you would write silly. And you would talk about, oh, well maybe. And even if it was a very sad picture, you could say, oh, silly. I think it was kind of sad, but I wonder what you're thinking about that's silly. So always, always validate. And on that note, I am going to turn it over to a couple minutes of questions. Thank you so much for your uh, introduction to literacy, to emergent literacy. It was pretty interesting to hear how everyone is capable of getting literate. So it's very encouraging and to start now. Okay, so here is a couple of questions. 
uh, from Swati, how do you use AAC to increase vocabulary in the case of apraxia? The child is still learning sounds, so apple sounds like apple and not as a congruent word. Okay, that's actually, um, that's a pretty easy one also. So the way that we learn language is not, we don't only learn language if we're able to produce it. The way that we learn language is that we have repeated exposure in meaningful situations. So whether somebody has apraxia or um, you know a, a physical disability that prevents them from speaking or really any kind of, of communication impairment that has them being a part-time or a full-time AAC user, the way to start working on literacy and expanding vocabulary is to talk to them and point to words. So think about what I was doing with Morgan. I was constantly talking and I'd point to words and then I would model it on the device. I would find it. Um, it's that kind of exposure and connection that will really help. It doesn't need to be um, anything specific. Yeah, uh, thanks. Now, Emanuela says uh, she would like to have the reference for what you had mentioned earlier. Uh, when we read and write, we use the same part of the brain as when we use AAC versus the part of the brain we use when we speak. So if okay. you can share it and I can, yeah, we can. You know what? I will actually have to find it. I was at a conference last week and that was the topic uh, of a portion of a a talk by somebody that was talking about um, accessing uh, everything, just accessing if you have a complex body. And she made a very, very clear point about the fact that it's it's a different part of the brain that we're not. So I will look it up and I will provide that resource to Lalitha. Sure. So, uh, Emanuela, if you can forward, uh, share, you can write to us at support at ourswasapp.com and uh, we will share with you uh, or you can share your email ID here and we'll share it across when Lauren sends it. Uh, another question quickly, if you have the time, Lauren. Uh, one last one. Okay. My child, uh, this is from Prashanti. My child is unable to use pictures in Avas to communicate, but whereas in keyboard mode, he uses prediction words and makes sentences sometimes quite meaningful. And sometimes just doesn't make any sense. How do I go about this? Okay. So I would, my my advice is always the same. Honor whatever, I mean, you're, you're seeing that your child has some really great ability. Um, and you don't need to kind of force into a, a method that maybe doesn't work for your child. So what I would do is validate. I would repeat back. So if 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 um, if a sentence is is built and it doesn't seem to make sense to you, you can you can say that. You can say, "Oh, well, you told me um, we told me something about the book, but you didn't say read. You said smell. I don't usually smell my books." I guess I could. And just, you just want to follow whatever you validate, whatever is there, because what happens is they learn because you respond to things. So a perfect example is with my Morgan um, that I, that you saw the video. There was one day where she selected on her device, bless you. She had no idea what she was pushing at that time. I'm pretty sure she didn't. It said, bless you. And then I looked at her and I said, oh, choo. I didn't, oh, I sneezed. From that point on, that young lady knows exactly what that word means, how to get to it and how to use it because she thinks it's really funny when I pretend to sneeze. Hmm. So it, it's all about the connection. Yeah. On that note, I think, yeah, it was all about connection. Literacy is all about connection is the really the core message and making it fun and not a, not a task. Yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing. Um, 
our biggest downfall is that we are so focused on academics and making sure that a skill is developed that we lose sight of the fact that learning needs to be fun and that the ultimate goal is connection. And that learning, you know, once we have those connections and, and joy, then the learning falls into place much easier. Thank you so much, Lauren, for uh, joining us today. And for My pleasure. Time off. Okay. And I think you got to run. So I do. I have to be in a school yes. building in yes. 25 minutes. <laughs> Oops. Okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much for taking this time. Sure. Okay. So we take care, everyone. The session. Take care. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing everyone next week, same time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.